the live. Okay. Michael, thank you so much for, for taking the time today. Thanks for having me. So as I told you a few seconds ago, uh, I like to start off my episodes with a little tidbit, a little story about my guest that perhaps the world doesn't already know about you on what's on the internet. Well, there's a lot of stuff on the internet, that's for sure. But I think um, people might be fascinated to know that I'm somewhat of a, um, uh, a homemaker, I would say. You know, I grew up with a mother that was crazy about cleanliness and, you know, keeping the house in order. So I cook and I clean and I iron clothes and I wash dishes and I do all that stuff. And people say, a mob guy does that? Oh, well, yeah. So I'm kind of a, you know, a homemaker in that regard. So. When, during your mafia days, was that something you, you didn't do at all? Never did it back then, no. But, uh, you know, I married a, a girl and uh, we're married 35 years and it's just my way now. And so, okay, let's go more in a, in a, in a chronological sense. Um, how you got into it in the beginning or not even just that. I'm more curious about if you can remember the first time you knew what maybe the mafia, what the mob was, what they were about. Um, if, if you maybe remember what age you were in that ballpark? Well, you know, I grew up in that life because my dad was a prominent figure. And I think, you know, dating really way back, the first time I really got a glimpse of what that life was all about. In the, um, I think it was the early 50s, there was a war in the Colombo family. And my dad was a prominent part of that. And I was about maybe four, five, six years old, somewhere in that area. It was mid-50s. And uh, my dad hadn't been home for a couple of days. And he arrived home, heavy beard. He hadn't shaved in a while because whatever was going on, you know, they, they had to hit the mattresses, so to speak. He came in the house, and he had a, a friend of his kind of outside standing guard, making sure nobody followed him. He embraced my mother, who was kind of in tears. And I was just sitting on the step, you know, kind of watching all of this, observing and wondering what the heck is going on. And he came over and he hugged me real tight. And, you know, we spent uh, uh, just uh, a short time together. And then he was gone. And my mother was really upset about it. So it was the first time I got a glimpse of that life, even though I didn't really understand what it was because I was, I was a kid. But, um, you know, and then from that point on, obviously, my dad being a very prominent figure, I started to pick up on, hey, there's something going on here. And so what was it about your dad that you think made him so prominent in, in that world? And then, you know, I mean, you talk about having uh, always cars around the corner uh, mm -hmm. near your house, always FBI's on watch, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, what was it that made your dad a successful mobster in, in his own right? Well, he was a very charismatic figure, for sure. Um, he was a guy that, you know, um, people took seriously. Uh, he was very strong, you know, and uh, very strong-willed. And he just had what it took to rise up in the ranks in that life. And um, as a result, you know, he gained a lot of respect. Um, and he also gained a lot of attention from law enforcement. So kind of a double-edged sword at that point. Uh, but I tell you, you know, my dad was as notorious, popular, infamous, whatever you want to put it, with the media and law enforcement in his day as John Gotti was in his day. I mean, he was, you know, that high profile. So, I mean, I got a taste of that very, very early on in my life. And then I think you also, in, in some past interviews, talk about how your dad never brought in uh, what he did into the house. Was there a first time that you got a sense of, other than that, the, the previous story you said, of, of really how serious, how dangerous the life outside was? Or did he never ever, um, you know, did he, did he always keep you guys comfortable and, and not fearing that, you know, you guys were always on watch or that his life was in jeopardy, that maybe your guys' lives was in jeopardy? My dad never talked about, you know, his lifestyle in the house. In the house, we were a family. But you couldn't help but know it because he kept getting arrested. We had law enforcement around us all the time. He always had his associates, you know, who I called uncle at the time, around the house, you know, bodyguards, whatever you want to call them. Uh, so, you know, I picked up on it early on that there was something going on, even though he never sat down and, and said, hey, this is what it's all about. But you had to be blind not to see what was going on. And, you know, you know growing up, because I viewed the police, law enforcement, the government as my enemy, trying to hurt my dad, trying to harass my family, I got into a lot of scuffles with them early on, you know, and, and so I just, 
I developed uh, a, a hatred and, and, and even in some cases a fear of them because I saw them as the bad guy. What were you like as a, as a kid growing up other than, you know, this stuff with the police? Were you pretty relaxed? Were you, uh, did you have any anger? I mean, you know, sometimes you, you hear these, uh, you know, other mobsters talk about there was anger against X, Y, and Z person. What were you like growing up? You know, I was pretty even-tempered, uh, but we always had so much turbulence and turmoil going on in the house because of my dad's, you know, notoriety. Uh, we had a lot of things going on. I had a mother that was, uh, uh, I don't know what to put it, she was very tense all the time, you know, it was, it was tough. And she was under a lot of pressure, obviously, because of all the stuff going on with my dad. So, I mean, it was, um, but I was pretty even-tempered. I mean, you know, I was an athlete in school, I played sports. And, um, you know, I just was able to get through it. I mean, I, I don't know. And then, so how old was uh, the first time, or when your dad went to jail for, the, how old were you um, when he went to jail for the, the big part? The you know, it was, uh, I was a teenager. Um, I think, uh, you know, his early arrests were in the 60s, you know, uh, early 60s. So, um, you know, I might have been 13, 14 years old when uh, he got really locked up on a murder case and he was in prison during the time, or incarcerated during the time of his trial. So that was several months, uh, might have been over a year, I don't recall at this point. But that was the first time he was taken away from us. And um, you know, then it just kept going from that point on, it just never ended. Do you think if your dad hadn't gotten incarcerated, you would have joined the mob? Uh, definitely not. Uh, he, he wanted me to go to school, he wanted me to be a doctor, first professional in the family. You know, I had some athletic ability, probably overrated in his mind. You know, he said, you're going to play for the New York Yankees. That wasn't happening. But, um, but you know, he, he looked at me in that way. You know, he was proud of me in that way. And there's no way, had he not, you know, gotten to the trouble that he got into, that I would have entered the life. And so then talk about that, uh, the day that you knew I'm going to get into the life. Well, you know, my dad had received a 50-year prison sentence um, uh, for a federal uh, crime that he was uh, convicted of. And Joe Colombo was a boss of our family at that time. He kind of took me under his wing. You know, I started to meet a lot of my dad's friends, but I still didn't aspire to be part of that life. That was never something that I thought about even. But when I went to see my dad in, in uh, prison, he was in Leavenworth, and I said, Dad, if I don't help you out, you're gonna die in here. You got a 50 year prison sentence, you're 50 years old, you're gonna die in prison. I gotta do something, I'm not going to school anymore. Because he told me he was innocent and I believe him until this day, based upon my own investigation. So uh, it was at that point in time that he proposed me for membership in the life. I didn't say, hey dad, I wanna become a member. He said, no, if you're gonna be on the street and you're gonna help me, then this is the best way. You know, he knew I had it in me. You know, he trusted that, he knew me obviously. And um, he said, I'm proposing you for membership in that life. And I said, okay, this is what's gonna work, then let's go. How did you think you could help him by entering the life? How to get on the street and make money. You know, I mean, these trials and these investigations cost a lot of money. Um, we had to uh, get to the witnesses that lied about him, you know, and committed perjury. We had to get them to uh, recant their testimony. So, you know, I had to get investigators, I had to get lawyers, I had to do my own legwork on that, because that was the only way he was going to get any relief. And do you remember the first time that you, I mean, you know, there's the whole gasoline thing, we'll get into that after, but um, the first time that you made a lot of money and you were like, wow, this is, this is all worth it. Well, you know, I, I was fortunate in that I, I had a head for business and I knew how to use that life to benefit me in the business. I picked up on it fairly quick. And uh, I started to make a lot of money in my 20s. I mean, you know, understand something too. Um, I got indicted three times before I was 25 years old. And I went to trial three times before that. And I beat every case, fortunately, or I would have been in jail. But, um, you know, during that period, I had to earn money to pay for my own attorneys and my own defense and so on and so forth. So I started to get very creative pretty quick. And, um, and things just worked out. I mean, I can't get into every aspect of the business that I did, but between legitimate and illegal, I was starting to make a lot of money. What and were some uh, of the, if like, maybe like a, a couple of the activities before the gasoline that um, you would make money from? Well, legitimately, um, I obtained, acquired, owned uh, two automobile dealerships. I had a leasing company, I had an auto body shop. I had. I had worked for um, a body shop that my father had an interest in. So I had an interest in cars back then. I was buying and selling and making money even as a kid. 
And uh, then I got involved with a flea market, a swap meet, where I managed that market over the weekends and figured out that, um, you know, one way to make money was to lend money to all the vendors. They always needed money. And I had a built-in audience. They couldn't go anywhere. They had to come to me to get their spots. So I would lend them money. They would pay me high interest. And I was making a ton of money just off the people in the, uh, the flea market. And that was my first taste of, you know, Shylocking, you know, lending at usurious rates, whatever. But they were happy to pay. And I was happy to give it to them. Where, did you, where do you think your head for business came from? I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's just in some ways innate. I mean, I, look, I made a lot of mistakes, too. I mean, you don't become a genius overnight. You know, I always tell people I, I learn more by my mistakes and my failures than I did by my successes. So, you know, I have had my hits along the way, certainly. But um, I, I think it's just an innate quality that you have. You know, you either get it or you don't. Do you remember some of those early mistakes that then helped you later on for to manage? Well, you know, just just overthinking myself, thinking I can do more than I was really capable of doing at the time, because um, I'm, I'm an optimist. You know, it's, it's hard to tell me I can't do something unless I try it and can't do it. So, uh, but I'm also realistic about it. But, um, you know, just the tried and true method, you know, and, and sometimes I, I did things that I ran into without having a clear plan. And I really realized and learned that before I do anything, I have to have a plan that I can see, I can map out, I can believe in, and then I could follow. So certain things along the way that I picked up that became very valuable to me. And at what point did you feel like you started like really earning the respect of the people on the street? Well, you know, I, I, it, it was difficult for me because I was a younger guy and you have a lot of resentment from the older guys in that life. So you had to, you had to be a little bit humble, but you also had to be forceful because, you know, in that life, you could be 20, a guy could be 70, and if you're a made guy, you have the same stature as him. So, um, but you also, in their eyes, have to earn that respect. And I think that, you know, I, I, um, I did the right thing with the right people. And when I started to earn money, people started to take notice. Um, I, uh, you know, I made other people earn around me, which is huge in that life. You make people earn, you get a lot of loyalty, whether it be real or not, but it, it happens that way. And then, uh, you know, when I landed on the big deal, well then, at that point in time, everybody wants a piece of you. And speaking of like money buying loyalty, I think I've heard you say that uh, in a couple other interviews. Do you feel like at some point that loyalty runs out? Do you think that um, money can only buy loyalty in perhaps the short term? Absolutely. It's, it's not a real loyalty. It's a loyalty based upon need and not based upon love and, and honor and respect. So, you know, in a lot of cases like that, when the money runs out, the loyalty runs out. In some cases, when the more money is still coming in, the loyalty runs out because they resent you and want what you have, and they don't want you to have what you have. So uh, that's something you gotta, you know, you gotta realize, especially in that life, because that can become very dangerous. Do, do you feel like, uh, or did you feel like you had any true, like real friends in that life? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I had friends. I had people until today that, you know, I miss because they're not around anymore. But uh, you can count them on one hand. That's for sure. Wow. So then talk about, um, you know, speaking of being made, uh, Halloween 75, the right. day you get made. We talk a little bit about that process for people who aren't familiar with um, the ritual, I suppose. Well, it is a ritual, and it's a very serious uh, ritual, very serious tradition in that life. You take a, a very solemn oath that I took very seriously back then. I take it seriously today, uh, even though I don't consider myself a member of the life. I mean, you know, what I know about that life is in my heart and my mind. It doesn't go away, and you can't just say, I'm not that person anymore, mentally. I mean, because in a lot of ways, you know, I still think that way. I mean, it was such a part of my life. I mean, I, not only did I grow up in it, but I lived it for over 20, almost 25 years. So uh, I always say when I um, got out of that life, I didn't get a lobotomy. You know, a lot of it is still in me. Uh, and a lot of times I have to fight it off, you know, quite honestly, just living my, my daily life. But, um, you know, it was a, a ritual. There were six of us that night that took the oath. And, um, you know, it was a blood oath. I mean, you know, some of my blood was shed and they put a saint in my hand and it burnt, you know, in my hand. And they told me if you violate uh, this oath, uh, betray your brothers and you'll die. 
and burn in hell, basically, like the saint is burning in your hands. Do you accept? And I said, yes, I do. And uh, it, was, um, it was an overwhelming, exhilarating feeling for me at that moment because, you know, I was a recruit for a couple of years. You got to earn your stripes. They're not just given to you. Even though my father proposed me, you still have to earn it. And so it was a big moment in my life, one of the biggest moments in my life, even though it was, you know, it was a bad moment, but it, it was a big moment. So you're, you're about 24, I think? I was 24, yeah. And, I mean, are you, are you nervous? Do you, do you have doubts of, like, you know, I don't know if this is the right thing. I mean, this is a, an oath for life. I had no doubt at that point in time. You know, to me, it was exhilarating because, you know, um, it was a, a bond with my dad. And I really idolized my dad at that point. And for me, it was like, not only are we father and son, but we're bound, you know, in another way by this oath that we took. So for me, it was, um, it was very exhilarating. I was, I was full in all the way. And what was it about this bond with your dad that was um, that was so strong? I mean, you literally, you know, sacrificed, uh, you know, going, continuing your your university and your your own potential career as a doctor in some medical field, and to to go and I mean, virtually kind of avenge your dad's um, your dad's time. What was it about uh, you and your father that brought you so close and made you you know ready to drop everything for him? I love my dad. I mean, he was a good father. Uh, he was very supportive of me. And um, I, I felt at that time he got a real bad rap and, you know, spend the rest of his life in prison. I mean, if, if, if I didn't do something to help him out, I wouldn't have thought well of myself. So, um, but there was this, this something between us. I mean, I, it was beyond love. It was more that I idolized my dad and just watching him, observing him, knowing how he treated me. Um, it was it was special, and I felt I owed him. How has your relationship with your dad um, influenced you as a father? Well, you know, look, my dad has taken a lot of raps uh, in a lot of different ways, and and I get it, I understand that. Um, but he was a good father. I, I perceive him to be a good dad. I mean, I know he loved his children. And he tried to teach me the right way, tried to teach all of us the right way. Unfortunately, he had a lot going against him. And so he taught me respect, he taught me honor, he taught me how to treat women and children. And I try to treat my kids pretty much the same way as the way I was brought up. And would you, would you update him? Uh, how often would you go visit him in jail and update him? Was he like able to make some decisions uh, from jail or how did that work? It was difficult because back in the day when my dad was uh, originally incarcerated in Leavenworth, his visiting was one day a month. Wow. And he only got one three-minute phone call a month. So it's hard. He's not part of your everyday life. You can't just call him up and say, hey, Dad, you know, give me some advice. So at that point, I was pretty much on my own. Now, major decisions that I felt I really would love his input on. Um, I, sometimes if I could, I'd wait until the end of the month and see him and discuss it with him, and he, and he gave me his advice. Can you remember maybe one of those major decisions that You know, uh, You know, it's hard. I mean, a lot of stuff involved my brother, because my brother had a, a drug issue at the time. My sister was going through some stuff, and, um, and then there was some things that, you know, after I got made, there was some things happened on the street that I might say, Dad, you know, what do you think? I mean, how should I handle this? And he'd always, he'd always give me his best advice, his take on it. And sometimes I agreed, and there was times when I started to mature in that life, I might have disagreed a little bit with him because I knew what was going on. I mean, it was, you know, I was living it, and he was trying to perceive it. So, uh, but we always got along. You know, we always worked it out between us, always got along. And were you and your dad much closer than your brother and your dad or your sister and your dad and how was your what was your family dynamic like back during that time well i i do believe my dad and i you know because not only were we father and son but we were bound by this this right. blood oath and and um you know that's a secret oath among people that are bound by it so my father didn't have that discussions with my brother my older brother um he didn't want any part of that life he was a straight kid straight guy he's older than me and, uh, and even though my dad loved him, you know, he looked at him in a different way. My younger brother, who my dad loved very much, uh, had a tremendous drug problem, very serious drug problem. So, you know, when somebody has that, you're limited in how much confidence or trust you can have in him. So my dad was limited by that. But 
I don't think he, he loved any of us unequally, you know, it was just different. So we had that special bond and the other kids in my family did not have that with him. And so take me back to, uh, to when you first start with the, with the gasoline business. Just a little background for people who aren't familiar with, with what you did and that's where, I mean, you made basically the chunk yeah. of your money. Yes. Will you talk about just kind of first time you got into it, what you saw in it, maybe exactly how it worked? Um, just to little, give a little background for people who aren't familiar well, with that. Well, I can't tell you exactly how it worked, but, <laughs> but we, can, we can get into it a bit. You know, what happened was a, a lot of people are under the impression that mob guys would sit in their social clubs and come up with all of these wonderful ideas on how to steal or make money or defraud the government. You know, it, it doesn't happen that way. Normally, somebody that operates a business or in business, they would come to us with an idea of how they can maybe defraud their company, how they can make some money. They would come to us because we can finance them, we could protect them, nobody's gonna bother them, we'll never tell on them, you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, and that happened to me quite often. So in Long Island, where my headquarters were at some point, I moved from Brooklyn to Long Island, uh, I was kind of the guy there. So people would come to me all the time, and this one person, Larry Irizzo, who had a a uh, small uh, gasoline operation out in Suffolk County came to me because some guys were trying to shake him down from another family, extorting him. And uh, he came to me for help. And long story short, without giving into all the details, he told me he had the germ of an idea on how to defraud the government out of uh, money on every, uh, out of tax money on every gallon of gasoline. So uh, that caught my attention. I didn't like the government. I didn't care about paying taxes at that point. And so, you know, we went into business together and, um, you know, it started out very, very small. We worked together conceptually on how to put it together and how not to get caught by the government. And we grew that operation into uh, uh, over eight year period of time, having over 300 gas stations we either owned or operated, 18 companies that were licensed to collect the tax on every gallon of gasoline once the law changed from collecting tax at the gas station level to collecting at a wholesale level. Um, I bought a terminal from British, British Petroleum and we had it in Oceanside, New York. We had trucks, we had everything. And I brought the Russians into it. And at the height of our operation, we were selling a half a billion gallons of gas a month. And we were taking down 20, 30, 40 cents a gallon, whatever the situation was that we were able to, to work. So it became a major, major operation that permeated through all five families. And, you know, a lot of people claim credit for, oh, it was me that did this and that and that. And the bottom line, they can claim all the credit they want. Um, you know, the government knows what happened. And I Rizzo became an informant. He told them everything, how we started and the whole thing. And, and so he and I put it together. And so, I mean, it's, it's been talked about in, in people that have watched your interviews. At the height of it all, you're making around six to eight million dollars cash a week. So uh, there have been numbers of like 30 million cash a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... For you, are you, describe your mentality during that period. Do you feel, um, do you feel like you're on top of the world? Do you feel like, I, I got the government? Um, I mean, are you, are you partying all the time? What's, I mean, what, you have so much money and you're so young. I mean, what's, what's well, a young Michael Franzis like at that point? Well, look, I had a big crew um, and we were, uh, we were well known. Um, I had my own jet plane. I had a Lear 25A. I had a helicopter, a Bell helicopter, that I used to drive the government crazy because they couldn't follow me. <laughs> you know, I had two boats in my backyard, and uh, I had a house in Florida, a house in New York, a house in Marina del Rey, California. And, uh, you know, I built a house on two acres of land in Long Island and uh, put a racquetball court in it. I mean, so I was living the high life. At the same time, I became a major target of the government. I kept fighting cases. I mean, I went to trial five times. So I had to deal with both. But um, I never felt invincible. That's, that's not the word. I always knew, like I said, I'm a pretty optimistic guy. I was a fighter. I fortunately had the resources and the wherewithal to fight the government. And they never really had a strong case against me, never. So um, I was always able to beat them at that point in time. But uh, listen, you know, there was a point in time, I had a house in Jericho, Long Island, and I, uh, I put a safe in my basement floor, and I always had $10, $12 million in cash in the safe. So you, when you have that kind of security, no matter what else happened, I said, oh, I got $10 million I'm sitting on, I'm not worried about it. You know, it's that kind of a thing. So yeah, I mean, I felt good about that. Is it hard now, um, 
you know, I mean, there's a big gap of time. We'll, we'll go through that after. But to to think about all these things that you did have, the jet, the plane, whatever, um, all the houses, and uh, this part of you maybe miss it in a sense? Sure I do. I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you know, I mean, it's, it's nice having those conveniences, those perks, uh, those luxuries, whatever you want to say. Do I long for it? No. You know, I've been there, I've done that, I've experienced it. Uh, what I look for now is just comfort. You know, I mean, look, I, I don't complain about my life. I work hard, but I get paid well and, uh, and I move forward. So I, I know I'm not going back. I'll never have that again. Um, I don't uh, desire to have it again in that way. That's for sure. I'm not going to do anything wrong. Look, I'll be honest with you. I can go back into the gas business. Nobody knows it like me. I can go back into that business tomorrow and I can probably steal a half a million dollars a month from the government and they wouldn't even feel it. There's still that, is it a loophole? Is it? There, there is a loophole. They wouldn't even feel it. And I could probably fly under the radar for quite some time, maybe forever, if I don't have a guy around me that turns informant, because that's how we went down before, my I, partner. I, then why don't you? What, what's holding because you back? Because I'm not going to jeopardize my family. I'm not going to break the law anymore. I'm done with that. And, uh, you know, I'm a person of faith. I mean, you either live that way or you don't. You know, I'm not jumping on both sides of the fence. So... Uh, but can I do it? Darn well right I can. And, and guys promote me all the time. Michael, you don't have to worry about anything. I'll handle everything. Yeah. Until they make a mistake, get caught, and then who's the government going to look for? You know, you got to understand, I'm, I'm, uh, I have three felonies. Uh, you know, I, I'm not looking for another one. That's a long gone. So we're talking about all these different luxuries and, you know, the life that you're living at this time. But I, I'm just more curious as to your, what's going on in your head? Are you, are you, would you say you were, you were happy? Was there, um, did you always live with a, with a constant fear of, you know, you have to look behind your shoulder, you have to see what's going on? And is someone in that life, I mean, you have everything in the world, uh, materialistically speaking, and money, but, you know, is there happiness? You know, Felix, for, for some reason, I've, I've had the ability to be happy through all the turmoil. I, I don't know, and, and I'm not happy because I'm wealthy, I'm not happy be. I think it's just my personality. I mean, I, I, I kind of like to dig through the stuff that's going on and just find that happy place. Now, I don't mean like I'm overjoyed and, you know, got a clear head and nothing's going on. I'm still, you know, fighting through it all. You know, I had a house in Florida and uh, I had it right on the intercoastal, I had a boat in the backyard, and I love the water. I love the water. I love boating. And I used to sit in my, through the most turbulent times in my life, you know, fighting cases, got stuff going on on the street, my dad, you know, my, my sisters, and all this stuff going on. I would sit in my backyard by myself, okay, and watch the boats go by. And I was the happiest guy in the world. It was like the most soothing, calming thing. And throughout all the turmoil, I was just, I, I always found that happy spot. So a lot of people say I made money, but I was never happy. Well, I can't say that. You know, I mean, through all my stuff, I was always managed to keep it okay. I'm all right. Did you have any other um, maybe little activities that would uh, just give you a second to just put everything business related to the side that you could do that would, um, that would put you in your own like Zen comfort state? It was that boating. You know, I would get on my boat at night, especially and drive down the, uh, the intracoastal at night where the water was so calm in Florida. Alone? No, there's no water alone. Yeah, wow. take my boat out, go alone, and spend an hour or two, and I was, I was the happiest guy in the world. Now, um, you know, I did have times when, you know, when I was in the hole and I thought my life was basically over, well, that was, that was a total opposite feeling, you know, because I just thought that was it, it was over. I got nothing to live for anymore. But, and when we talk about, because uh, I've, I've listened to a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of your interviews and I don't think very many go into this, you know, to what you just said about being in the hole and, and stuff like that. We go more into that and, and what uh, maybe that time period, what was going on and how you felt like your life was, was over. Well, this was, you know, a lot had gone down. This was after I beat the Giuliani case. Um, and I took a plea on the gas case because my partner became an informant. 
And even though he testified against me in the Giuliani racketeering case and I was acquitted, jury didn't believe him, uh, I saw an opportunity to try to wrap everything up. I knew that life was in trouble. I saw all my friends going down for 50 years, 100 years. The racketeering law was destroying everybody. People were turning informant left and right. I just met this young woman that I fell very much in love with and I wanted to preserve my life. So I decided to take a plea. And I got a 10 year sentence, $15 million restitution. I gave up the plane, the helicopter, the whole bit. And I went off to do my time. I did five years, I came out on parole, violated my parole and they put me back in. And that first night that I went in was without a doubt the low point in my life because it was the first night that I really believed, the first time I really believed that my life was over. I'd spend the rest of my life in a hole. Uh, I had nobody to turn to. Guys on the street were all upset with me because I left the life, a contract on my life. My father disowned me for a time. Um, I had just, you know, been married for a short time. Um, you're going to lose my wife, never see my kids again. The government hated me because they feel I pulled the wool over their eyes, making them believe I was going to cooperate, but then never did. So I had, didn't have a friend in the world. And I said, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in this six by eight cell. At the age of 40, I'm done. It's over. And that was, without a doubt, the low point that evening, that night. And um, it, it went up from there, even though I spent almost three years in solitary on that violation and was able to work my way out of that situation. But it was bad. So, I mean, I've had extreme highs and I've had that extreme low in my life. So I, I know, you know what that's all about. In that moment, did you regret everything that had happened or was it? You know, you know, when you're, you don't have time to regret it. You're not thinking back, I should have did this, I should have did that. You're just thinking it's over. You know, I'll say something that I, I think can, can give you the depth of understanding. There was a point in my uh, time in my life when I would demean people that were suicidal. I would say, hey, they're weak, can't face up to their troubles. After that night, I, I've never done that again because I wasn't suicidal. But it was so painful to think of my future that I just wanted to close my eyes and not wake up. I didn't want to put my family through what I had to go through with my dad and have them visiting me for the next 20 years. I didn't want to think about my wife leaving me for somebody else. I didn't want to think about never seeing my kids. It was extremely painful. So I, it wasn't looking back. It was just right now, just take it away. And you've been um, uh, in the last, I think, couple decades very uh, open about your, uh, your devotion to Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, did that come from, I mean, was it pre-jail that you started believing more or was it in jail that you really um, found your devotion to, to the religion? It was in jail. I mean, my wife and her mother, my mother-in-law, were devout Christians. And they tried to, I don't want to say lay it on me, but uh, tried to get me to believe and understand. And I listened out of respect. But I wasn't buying into it because up until that point is, hey, I'm my own guy. I'm taking care of my future. Uh, God helps those who help themselves. You know, I grew up as Catholic. That was my thinking. So I wasn't really buying into it uh, in a big way. But, you know, having spent three years almost in solitary, 24-7, me and God, and studying and doing the work and really coming to the realization that um, Christianity was the real thing for me, um, that's what did it. I mean, it cemented it in my heart and my mind during that time. So you talk about, you get into to solitary, it's like an all time low, and then it goes up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Is it, um, when you talk about that progression mentally, do you, and then, I mean, are you also starting to maybe realize towards the end of those three years or that you're gonna get out, um, the positivity? I mean, you say you're someone that's, that's very positive. How does one continue to stay positive uh, in solitary confinement all day for, for three years? Well, for me, it was, it was really diving into my faith, diving into my Bible, um, being motivated by the fact that um, I wanted to see my wife and kids again. And during that time, I was still fighting off the government because they were claiming they were going to do all these things to me. And I fought back. So um, there was a point in time when I realized, OK, this is, this is going to work out. I am going to get out and um, I'm going to resume my life. So again, I'm a fighter. So I always kept, you know, I, except for that one night when I said, that's it, you know, I was able to pick myself up again. Again, spiritually was, was tremendous uh, impact on me. 
um, and and just started to, well, I'm trying to think, I mean, it just started to get a little bit better. And I had my bad days too. I had my bad moments, my bad hours when I was in there. You know, solitary is extremely difficult, Felix. It's, it's torture in a way. And a lot of guys, when those lights went out at night, I heard a lot of moaning and groaning and a lot of, it's, we weren't meant to be solo creatures. We were meant to be social. And to be put in that situation, it's, it's torture. And that's why I don't believe our, our young people, unless they're really a danger to somebody else, they shouldn't be put in that situation because that's life destroying. They, they'll never get themselves back again. So, uh, but I got through it, you know, and, and uh, I, I think I'm okay. And there, I mean, there are other former um, people who are involved with the, with the mafia and the mob that I've either talked to or, or listened uh, to interviews of who talk about, uh, I'm pretty open about having, you know, PTSD. Do you feel like that's something that you endured? Do you still feel like, uh, does that ever keep you up at night, those, those days in solitary and, and that time? And is it, you know, traumatic in a sense? No, uh, I don't think I have any after effect of that. Um, you know, there's times my wife says to me at night, I'm fighting with somebody, but that's probably I'm fighting with somebody on the street from way before. No, I, I don't think I have any ill effects. I'm, I'm not claustrophobic. Uh, I don't really dwell on that time. I have to talk about it because it's part of my testimony and I'm, I'm speaking every week about it. Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't go backwards. I don't dwell on it. Did your kids um, fully understand what was going on when you when you went to jail, and and did you have that same relationship with with them the way your father did with your family when you were growing up? Of we're not going to bring outside business into the house. Uh, yeah, I mean, until today, I've never sat down with my kids and had a discussion about my former life. None of them. You know, maybe my oldest boy, John, he's forty-one. I have. I was married twice. I was married for a short time prior to Camille and I have married 35 years, but I had three children with them. And, and my regret in life is that when their mom and I split, um, not only did we split, but I went off to prison in California. So I was taken away from them for over 10 years. And then I had my issues on the street that were, were forced me not to be able to go back there. So I really lost that relationship with them. And that's, that's, if I have any regret in my life, that's the regret that I have. So, so you said um, that you've never sat down and had a conversation with your kids about um, your former life. Do they, I mean, do they know, I mean, they know of you and what you did, no? To, well, if, if I've they had, look it up or if they go on YouTube. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm sure they've Googled, probably my boys, not so much my girls. Um, they know everything because I've had such a high profile, you know, I mean, it's out there. They've heard me speak. Uh, I doubt they read my books. Um, they don't watch any documentaries about me. They don't go on YouTube. They, wow. they don't want to know that. They, they don't, don't want to. That's they don't want to know. And, and my wife's the same way. Would you be willing to, if they were like, Dad, can we ask you questions about her to, to have that sit down? Would you, would you I, I would be them? open with them, yeah. I mean, I, I'd probably feel worse talking to them than just anybody else, but um, they've never asked, but if they do, I mean, yeah, I mean, if it comes to that, I will. But I doubt they never, will, they ever will. Um, do you feel any? Uh, I mean, you said you know you, you would talk to them, and it would be a little different if you talk to them than, than someone else. Obviously, where does that come from? Is there part of you that feels? Um, I don't, I don't think shame is the right word, but but what's what would hold you back from or, or make you a little bit less at ease of having that conversation with them about the person that you were before? You know, I think it's just the old, you know, I never involved even my first wife in any of my business. Never sat down, never discussed it with her, never spoke to her, never asked her advice, never shared anything. Um, it was just my way. And with my current wife, you know, 35 years, I've never sat down with her and had a conversation about my former life. Never. She's heard me speak, but we didn't never have never done a one on one. She won't read my books. Documentary comes on about me, she'll turn it off. She said, I lived enough, I don't have to know that anymore. And I think in a way it it, it maybe scares her a little bit. And she has told me that. She said, when I think of certain things and I think that that's what you're a part of, like she might see something about someone else talking about that life and saying, wow, my husband was also part of this. So I think in a way it scares her. And she doesn't want to know that part. And you say, um, you know, 
that in, in many ways you're still the same person as before. Um, how different is, you know, maybe at the height of, of when you were running all the businesses um, to now? I mean, you know, when I talk to you now, it, you're very calm and reserved. And uh, were you the same way before? I mean, was there, from, from some of the other interviews that I've, that I've watched you, it seems like there was more of a... Uh, confidence in, in what you were doing with with all the business regards but I mean it seems like for the most part you were kind of the same person in a lot of respects no would you disagree with that well yeah you know understanding that life um, you don't lose your cool too often and you certainly don't lose it with the wrong people right. um, and you don't let people you don't tip your hand to anyone that quickly so I learned that I learned how to maintain myself and my control you know, through all the sit downs and all the meetings I had with people that it, uh, you had to, you had to be smart. Because if you didn't, the consequences could be severe. So I was always pretty even tempered. I have a temper, no question about it. And uh, I don't like it to come out. Um, so I guess, you know, when you, as a person of faith, we're, we're told that we are a new creation. The Bible tells us that. So spiritually I am, in many ways, mentally I am because I just won't do things that I did before. So that makes you a new creation in, in Christ. But I'm not a different person. I, you know, like I said, I didn't get a lobotomy. You know, this time, I, I'll be honest with you, every time I go to a gas station, I get upset because I wish I was still stealing the taxes. I don't have a moral issue. I'm telling you the truth, and I've said this in church. I don't have a moral issue with taking money from the government tax-wise. I don't because I believe I can do better with it now, especially than they can. But I won't do it. I won't break the law. <laughs> but morally, I don't have a problem with it. Do you still, um, that, that's interesting, do you still feel like uh, you have this anger or resentment towards you know, government, cops, law enforcement in that regard? I mean, no, not at all. I mean, I have many friends in law enforcement. You know, this distorted sense of view I had is gone. I respect law enforcement. You know, people have said, oh, Michael, how can you do that? It's very simple, you know, especially the, the police on the street. I mean, I have a wife. I have five daughters. I expect them to protect my wife and children when they're out, you know. I have a lot of friends now in law enforcement because I understand they're real people like me. You know, they have families. They, they, they love people. They bleed. You know, I, I have certain resentment towards the government hypocrisy that I witness. You know, it, it troubles me a lot, you know, because... These people take an oath um, to, to work on behalf of the American people, and they don't do that. It's like, look, I was involved with many politicians. I know the deal. I, believe me, I can see right through these people, right through them, because I've experienced them. I've had conversations with them. I've financed them. I've, I've, I've been involved with them. And that's what bothers me, because I say this all the time. When I was on the street, that's who I was. I was a mob guy. All the other mob, we were mob guys. We didn't pretend to be out there to help you and help the world. We were doing what we were doing. But these people don't do that. They're out there pretending that they're working for you when it's really all about their own power. How much did the, uh, I mean, you see it some in the, in the Irishman that came out, but how much did the mob uh, really, con or you even in particular, uh, control the political scene of uh, back when you were in heavily involved in life? The word is influence. We had tremendous influence. We had tremendous influence through the unions. Okay, why? Because look, you control the Teamsters in many ways, you control the country. You got two and a half million people. You got trucks that are delivering goods all over. You got huge, huge, huge pension funds that have tremendous amount of money that can help politicians win in, in certain ways. So you control the Teamsters, you control the docks, you control the the unions throughout the country, you, you control the country in many ways, or you have influence, I should say, uh, in many ways, politically and every other way. So we had that control. Was there ever um, kind of direct uh, pressure or um, perhaps financial pressure that you or uh, you know, people from your crew or your family uh, would put on politicians? Well, we didn't have to put a lot of pressure on them because they came to us. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you know how many fundraisers I went to? You know how many donations that I made to politicians? We wanted favors in return. I had 18 licenses, 18 licenses 
okay, to collect, to, to, uh, to allow us to collect taxes, okay? I had a connection to get all the licenses. You can't get 18 licenses. And they were to Panamanian companies. They weren't even to American companies, okay? So I paid people to get it, and I got it. So, you know, look, money in many ways makes the world go round to, to a lot of people, and politicians are no exception to that. How do you think that's changed, um, or do you think it's changed in uh, the political scene today? How much do you think the mafia, I mean, the mafia is very different today, but do you still think there is uh, some influence in the politics of today? Not as much. Definitely not as much. But today, I mean, you know, look, I mean, all of these lobbying groups and everything else that, that, that are constantly lobbying, you know, politicians and putting money in their coffers in different ways and, and influencing them. It's the same game, you know, the rules haven't really changed. The players might have, uh, but it's so obvious, so evident. And I'm also curious, uh, because I've heard you talk about it in, in some other uh, interviews, you're big in the, in the sports world. There was a lot of uh, heavy influence there. Um, will you talk about just a little bit of background information for, for the people who aren't familiar, kind of what that looks like when uh, a high level mafia uh, boss like yourself is dealing with athletes, with sports books, with gambling. I mean, is there direct uh, game fixing that you knew of? I know that there are a lot of players uh, who would, you know, uh, come to you or come to one of your sports books and try to place a big wager, and a lot of them had problems, and then you would meet with them. Like, will you talk about a little bit of uh, all of that world that you got involved with during that time? Well, you know, the control of athletes, or, or I, I should say the, the ability to compromise the outcome of a game comes through gambling. Athletes gamble, they get themselves in trouble, uh, they're targeted, we know who they are when they start gambling with bookmakers that we control, and if they get themselves to a point where they're in deep, um, we tell them there's only one way to get out. You know, you're going to shave points, you're going to compromise the outcome of a game, and that's the way you'll get out of this debt. And it happened quite a bit, because athletes, at least during my time, and I know for a fact because I still deal with them, they like to gamble. It's, a, uh, it's an extension of their competitiveness. You know, I like to put some money on a game, raise the stakes, so I get more interested in it, you know? And I'm not a heavy gambler at all. I just enjoy it. So take that to another level with athletes who are constantly competing, you know? And it's just a high of competing, but they get themselves in a lot of trouble. I found out athletes are not good gamblers. <laughs> they gamble with emotion. They, they just don't know the score. So they get themselves in trouble. Would they gamble on, their, gamble on themselves or gamble on most Depends. of the other events? You know, the, the games that they're involved with, maybe, and games they're not involved with. You know, it depends on every other sport. I mean, they just, they just love to gamble. So what happens if an athlete is, is in deep with you, 400, 500K? What, what's that conversation like with you and them? Well, you know, back then, different than it is today. They weren't making, the pros weren't making the kind of money they're making today, obviously. If a pro got himself in trouble for two, three, four hundred thousand, he was in pretty deep. So, you know, the conversation would go, I mean, I'll never forget, Bookmaker would call me up, hey, so-and-so, you know, played for this team, he's into me pretty heavy, you know, he owes me 50 grand, 100 grand. He said, should I cut him off? I said, why would you cut him off? You're putting his, an entry on a piece of paper, it doesn't cost you a dime. I said, let him get into you for 250, 300, let him keep going, and then bring him to me. And that's what would happen. They'd come to me and I'd say, look, you owe me a lot of money, how are you going to pay it off? You're not going to walk away from it, how are you going to pay it? You got a rich uncle, you got a grandfather, go find the money and bring it back to me. I said, but I'll tell you what, I like the team, I like you, you know, you're impressing me, I'm gonna do you a favor. Don't pay me at all, but you're gonna pay me 2%, 3% a week on the outstanding balance in cash every week. I want you here Monday morning after your weekend games, okay? And take as long as you want. So what happened? He'll say anything to get out of the room. Oh, no problem, no problem, okay. And he starts paying, but he thinks that I don't know that he's across town gambling with another bookmaker because he can't help himself and he's getting himself in trouble there. So finally that money stops. We bring him back in again. What happened? Stop paying me. Here's what you're going to do, okay? Tomorrow night you're favored to win by 10 points. Don't win by 10, win by 3. Next week playing football, you're favored to win by 2.5. You're not going to win the game. You're a quarterback. First three times you get the ball, you put it in the hands of the other receiver. You're a running back. First time you get, put it on the ground. I'll worry about the rest. And that's it. And, you know, because remember, it's never about winning, losing. It's all about the spread. That's it. So you manipulate, you have an athlete, and you can manipulate the spread over a series of games. 
you're going to come out ahead most of the time. And so then would you yourself then knowing maybe a little bit of what they're going to do, uh, then place wagers with another book? Sure. Well, yeah, we, we know what to do at that point. Yeah. Wow. And are there any, um, I mean, maybe without names or, or things like that, but, uh, maybe big events or big games that you can remember uh, that stood out to you of times that you knew was completely fixed? Well, remember this. You know, people are the Super Bowl, the Super Bowl. Why would you fix the Super Bowl when you got 300 million people looking at it? Right. You got the highest security in the world. You got everybody's, you know, alert about the game. When the game, you know, two weeks prior, nobody's looking at it really, and you make just as much money. It doesn't matter. So, you know, it's not really, at least from my perspective, at that point in time, it wasn't those high-profile games that you were worried about. You want, get, you want to fly under, in that life, when you're doing something illicit, you want to fly under the radar. You don't want to bring attention to yourself. Right. So if you're smart, now there's some people, they just can't help themselves. They're going to, any, any game you give them, they're going to try to work it out. If you've got a player or a coach or somebody, an umpire, you know, a, a referee, you got an umpire or a referee, you, you got, it's better than a player. It's more valuable. Are you dealing with all of the New York-based pro teams? I mean, players from all of them? We dealt with a lot of New York teams, yeah. And is, there, is it weird to you now, um, knowing all of these uh, different athletes and people that are involved that probably a lot of people don't, wouldn't really expect um, were involved in those games? Could you estimate perhaps around how many different people or interactions you had with or professional athletes um, that you dealt with and, and kind of example that you gave uh, just it, a minute There were several athletes gambling with, with our bookmakers, several. Because remember, back in my day, you didn't have online access. Right. If they were gambling, they had to gamble with a bookmaker. They didn't want people to know they were gambling, so they'd gamble with a bookmaker. You know, It's not like they're going to OTB and start you know, betting on, on, on the track. They didn't want to do that. So they had to come to us. Different today. Today they can go online. I mean, a lot of these online gaming houses uh, have some mob influence in them. I know that for a fact. So, and and they're able to identify the people that are gambling with them. So, I'm not into it now, so I can't comment as as intelligently about it. But I'm sure uh, that there's influence there. And how much do you think? I mean, you know, we we, we kind of touched on it earlier that the the mafia is very different nowadays. But how? Uh, I mean, I don't know if you still like know anything about what's going on, but do you, how different is it nowadays? How, I mean, it, it can't, obviously it can't be like it was back in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s, but um, on a scale of like one to 10, how, how would you rate it in terms of their presence, um, especially in, you know, some of the popular areas like Brooklyn and, and New York and all that? Well, let, let me put it this way, you know, in New York, um, there's still five families. It's not going away in my lifetime. Is it the same? No, because the government has done a tremendous amount of work on, you know, taking power away from that life. And that started, you know, with Rudy Giuliani in the mid 80s when they started using the racketeering laws very effectively. A lot of guys became informants. It was a whole different ball game. But I'll give you a, a little bit of insight to that. During my time in that life in New York, we had five families. We had about 750 made guys, guys that actually took the oath. Um, if I recall, there were approximately 1,400 agents assigned to those 750 guys. So for every guy, you had almost two agents, you know, investigating. Today, you may have almost the same numbers on the street, but you have, from what I know, and I think you can bear this out, less than 100 agents. Wow. Because why? Now their major focus is what? Terrorism. There's other things. They move them around. They figure, okay, we did enough to this life at this point in time. It kind of runs in cycles. But I know I don't sell my former associates short. They're building up again. They're doing it smart. They're under the radar. They're kind of, you know, keeping things a little bit more quiet. When I was in that life every single day, every day, New York Post, Daily News, New York Times, there was a mob story. Every single day. I was a subject of many of them. So was my dad. Every day. Now, I read the New York papers every day. I mean, if I see it every three months, if I see one story, it's a lot. They're flying under the radar, but they're there. So I'm also very curious as to um, one aspect that we just, that we just talked about earlier um, off, off camera. Uh, I think it was in the 80s, perhaps, the, the big magazine that came out uh, with the top 50 most powerful and wealthiest uh, mob bosses. And at the time, I think you were like 18th. 
-hmm. But the big thing that was most interesting about that was that you were 35 and the next one I think was Gotti at 46 years old. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, you know, in, in previous interview, I think it was the, the Valuetainment one, uh, you talk about all 48 others of on, those li on that list are dead and the other one uh, is in jail and you're the only one here walking, yeah. walking free. From what I understand, I know 48 are dead. The 49th, I don't know if he's died recently in prison. I'm not sure. Um, I heard he was, he was dead. He was an older guy, but I, I'm not sure of that. But at least 48 are gone, and, uh, and I'm still here. So, Do you think it was because, um, I mean, what, talk about the decision to, to step away from the life, which I think is, is uh, probably the most remarkable one and I think shows uh, your level of intelligence to, because, I mean, you, you knew at that point the ways to make money, the ways to get away with making money, um, and to live a lavish lifestyle but you chose to, to prioritize your family and your well-being and, and ultimately your life over, over that. Will you talk about that, that thought process and when, if there was maybe a specific day or if it took uh, a certain amount of time for you to realize, okay, once I get out of jail, no more? Well, again, you know, there was a lot of things that, that um, came into my decision to walk away. The, the immediate motivation was my wife. I didn't want her to experience what my mother had experienced, you know, or what every other wife of every other member experienced, and that is their husband goes away forever or for a lengthy period of time, family's destroyed. So I said, why would I marry this young girl and bring her into that? So marry her to destroy her life because I'm not going to be with her. So I realized if I was going to be with her, I had to make some changes. But here's a dilemma. How do you get away from that life? Again, I didn't sell my former associate short. I was also torn because I took a blood oath that meant a lot to me. How do I betray my father? Because if I walk away, he's going to look at it as a, as a betrayal. And how am I going to survive? Because I know anybody that's survived that hasn't gone into the witness protection program, but I don't want to hurt anybody. So that's not who I am. I don't want to testify. I don't want to go into the witness protection program. I don't want to do any of that. So I had all of these dilemmas running through my mind, but at the same time, I knew the life was in trouble because you know, Greg Scarpa, longtime associate of ours, Colombo guy, I find out he's a government informant for 30 years. Another guy, Willie Boy Johnson, you know, a gaudy guy who I was friendly with, Shylocking money with, I found out he's a government informant. Now, who else is a government informant? I mean, I'm around all these people that we're finding out, and now, okay, it's become worse because under these racketeering laws, you don't go away for five years anymore. You don't go away for 10. You go away for 30, 40, 50, and you got no parole anymore. You're going to do 85% of your time. How many guys are going to stand up under that? I said, the life is in trouble. The government has now put the weapons and tools together to really put a dent in our life and destroy us. And me, I'm one of the most high profile guys out there, and I'm the youngest guy out there. I go down, they're going to give me 150 years, 200 years, my life will be over. So all of these things are playing into it. Well, I said, I got to try to make a break. And, uh, and that's really, I mean, look, I would go to sleep at night, leaving the life, wake up, coming back into it. It was, it was such an emotional torture for me because I didn't want to be known as a guy that betrayed his oath. But then again, I, I wanted to preserve my life. So it was, it was very difficult. How much did you fear death when you were in the life? Well, you know, I, I was conscious of it. You know, I had an experience where, you know, one of the horrors of that life, you make a mistake, your best friend walks you into a room, you don't walk out again. And unfortunately, I witnessed that throughout my time in the life. And I had that experience one night where I was walked into a room, I didn't know if I could walk out. So I, I knew when I left that I could face death. Don't get me wrong, I was scared. I was scared as can be. But somehow I walked into the room, I'm here, um, so I realized that I could face death if I had to when I tried to make the break. So, you know, um, I, you don't live in fear every day. I mean, you know, people think that, that, that you're always looking over your shoulder, you're always li living in fear. No, but I was always uh, very aware of what was around me, what was going on. And I was very aware of not making a mistake that could cost me my life. So it's more awareness than fear. So then you, you leave, uh, you get out of jail, and then you come westward here to California. Yeah. And so how do you, you know, I mean, what, what was that like for you to, to now escape, you know, the East Coast? I mean, are you still, 
you know, I, I know you were like moving all over the place, never keeping the same patterns. Mm -hmm. I mean, at what point did that kind of stop? And how do you how do you even resume somewhat of a regular life at, at that point? Well, I would have never made it in New York. You know, there's no way. I mean, there's too many guys there. And I was too well known. And, you know, you, you can't, I, I would have never made it. I had to leave town. And I knew I had a shot out in California because there's really nobody out there that I had to worry about. Um, and I know they're not, it's not easy to send guys out there, you know, a hit squad to try to get you without getting caught when I was aware of that. So, I mean, that had to be the first move. Um, you know, it, it was over a period of time when everybody that really had it in for me, they either went to prison or they died. And people started to realize I wasn't putting anybody in prison. That's not what I was about because there was a real concern for that because the government did me dirty. They put my name on the witness list of trials that were going on in New York. So when I was telling people I'm not testifying, nobody believed me. And I understand that. But that's how the government works at times when they're trying to, you know, to get you to inform. So, but after, then I get violated, I go back to prison, people are saying, hey, what's, maybe he's not hurting anybody. So that kind of, the urgency in coming after me kind of subsided, I believe. And then again, people had their own troubles. I'm kind of out of sight, out of mind for a while. But then I'm back in mind because I'm doing speaking engagements, I'm doing this and you know. So I mean, I, I, I got out of the fire and then threw myself back in. But again, you know, I, Felix, I wasn't looking to name people. I wasn't looking to hurt people. When I talk, I'm not going into individual people and saying they did this and that. And that. What, what good is that? You know, what am I going to do with that for? I'm not trying to make a name on everybody else. I am who I am, and I do what I do, and I talk about my life. And I don't think there's anything wrong with talking about my former life, because I've told people this, I tell this to young kids, and I'll say it, you know, with full confidence. The mob life, the street life, the gang life, they're evil lifestyles. Now, why do I say that? I'm not calling the guys evil. I was one of them. I just happen to be very fortunate, very blessed to get out. But I don't know any family of any member of that life that hasn't been totally devastated, including my own. And not my wife and kids, but my mother and my father. I had a sister who dies of an overdose of drugs. My brother's a drug addict 25 years. Uh, you know, my other sister, 42 years old, dies of cancer. My father does 40 years in prison. My mother, 33 years without a husband. Destroyed family. And every fa family that I know of, every member has the similar story. So any lifestyle that does that to families is evil. So I will talk about that and I will encourage young people not to get involved, get away from it. Plus, you're not gonna beat the government today. They got too many tools, too many weapons, too many informants on the street. It's only a matter of time before you go down and you gotta be, you gotta be so foolish not to see that. I mean, just look what's going on around us. Read the paper, just go on social media. It's there. I don't care if you're the biggest drug king in the world, you're going down at some point in time. That's it. So um, I don't have a problem talking about that because that's what I believe. And I want to encourage people to try to do the right thing, stay away from that stuff. And I'm also uh, curious because, uh, I mean, your dad is, is still alive. He's yeah. over, he's 100 and... My dad will be 103, wow. February 6th. Unbelievable. 103. Um, and you guys have had uh, ups and downs that have been uh, pretty public. What is your relationship uh, with him now? And how, I mean, you guys still ever talk about uh, mob times or, or what's going on? And, and what, what are his spirits now today? And how does he, you know, I mean, it's amazing that he's 103. Uh, how does he live his life today? Well, look, my dad's got a, a very strong will to live, obviously. What he's been through, most people are not going to survive. And um, he'll be 103. He's in a rehab facility in New York. And uh, he's pretty lucid for his age, no doubt about it. Uh, better than most people would be at that point in time. And we have a relationship. It's not the same. It's, it's not the same. I still love my dad. I'll never do anything to hurt him, never did. Um, and, and I only have good things to say about him as my father. Now we've had our differences because the, the one thing, you know, I, I feel my dad doesn't take enough responsibility for what happened in our family because in his view, he was framed. And if he wasn't framed, he would have been out and the family would have been okay. So I kind of get it. But in the same token, he doesn't take responsibility and he should, like I should. You know, I put a lot of hurt on my family for quite some time. I'm, hopefully I've been able to reverse that. But 
Um, you know, I still love and respect him. I don't think I see him as often as I should. Uh, we do have, when I do get together, we do have dialogue about the old times. Um, but I, I don't know, he may be around for another five, six, seven, eight, ten years. I don't know. He, he's a strong guy. I'm wondering, do you also, do you feel like you can be um, part of that life uh, and be a good person? I mean, when you, t when you think about, uh, you know, especially with Christianity and all that, uh, you know, some, some people say, well, you were around people even if you weren't doing X or, or Y or Z, you were still around it. Um, you're still around killings and stuff like that. Do you still feel like you can be in the mafia and a, and a good man at heart? The answer to that is yes, because it's hard to judge. Look, there were times when I did things in that life that I was very uncomfortable with, very uncomfortable with, but I did them anyway. I had to, okay? Or let's put it this way, in my mind I had to. Now, could I have said no, I'm leaving and face the consequences? Yes, we all could. We can't blame other people for the decisions that we make. Um, but I was never comfortable about it. I never said, hey, I love doing this. I'm an evil guy and this is what I want to do. So does that mean I'm a good person? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't say. Does it mean I'm a terrible person? I don't know. That's for other people to judge. I know I love God. I love my wife. I love my kids. And I try to, uh, I, I try to be as best as I possibly can. Um, and I know a lot of guys in that life that I think were good people. I really do. I think my father, you know, inwardly is a good person. I really do. He's not out to hurt people. You know, I don't want to make a mistake in saying this, but please understand, everybody is focusing in on murder in that life. Murder, 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 murder. You know, murder was very serious in that life. We weren't random killers. We all took an oath, and that oath is, hey, if we make a mistake, if we violate the oath, we can pay for it with our life. Our eyes are wide open, and that's the consequences. You either accept it or you don't. And we didn't go around killing other people. It was all mostly internal. We killed each other. You know, you've heard that statement a lot, but it's true. And sometimes people would kill for the wrong reasons, because it's like anything else. Greed, power, it, it, you know, it happens on the street the same way it happens in a legitimate world. Same way. You know, but... Um, that's just the way it is. Does that make somebody a bad person because they bought into that? I don't know. That's for other people to judge. Do you feel like it's, uh, do you feel like, I mean, you went to jail, obviously it's not, not ideal and, and you served a sentence, but do you feel like, I mean, you're now 68, you've been out for a good amount of time, you're able to, to live a normal life and you're alive. Do you feel like in many ways uh, you're lucky or it's a miracle that you're still that you live the life that you have today? Because most people, I mean, I'm sure back 20 or 30 years ago, even when you first got to jail, you didn't expect to be at least this comfortable. Was, is that a fair assessment? 100%. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm probably one of the most blessed, fortunate persons who walk in the face of the earth. I know that, and I, I never forget it, and I'm thankful to my God every day about it because I should have been or could have been dead or in prison for the rest of my life. It didn't work out that way. I think there was another purpose and plan for my life. So, and I don't forget that. And I'm not, I don't say I'm entitled to it. I don't say I deserve it. Um, but I'm here and I'm, I'm not upset about it at all, you know? So what could I say? Are there any of your uh, perhaps former uh, enemies, or I know, uh, I think in one interview you talked about, you'd love to be in a room with Giuliani and have a sit down. And <laughs> are there any people that you have now uh, you know, since you've gotten out, been able to to talk to that you probably wouldn't have back 20 or 30 years? Are there any people that you'd like to uh, perhaps have a sit down with and now that it's all over, uh, maybe make amends? You know, I would gladly sit with Giuliani, you know. I, I, I'd love to tell him, hey, Rudy, out of all the guys you indicted, I'm the one guy that beat you <laughs> because everybody else got convicted. Yeah. And I'm telling you. Yeah, I don't know how he'd, he'd take to that, but that'd be <laughs> fine. But... Um, you know, I'll tell you one thing that, uh, that was very encouraging to me, very satisfying. About seven, eight months ago, I spoke at a church in Long Island, and there were three people there from my past, okay? Two of them were detectives that arrested me, um, and they attended the service, and one of them was the court bailiff in one of my trials. And they came up to me, they were all retired, congratulated me, were happy to see that, you know, I have a life. 
Uh, we reminisced about something. He reminded me about something that happened the day that he fingerprinted me. And I said, wow, this is really, this, I've really come full circle to have guys that were once my enemies, you know, and had personal involvement with me, coming to hear me speak and actually being happy that I have a life. And I was very thankful to God on that day. And I said, this is, this is really meaningful to me. What's something that um, Michael Franzese now would tell a young 22, 22-year-old Michael Franzese? Well, you know, I, it would be very hard for me to tell young Michael Francis, under the circumstances that were going on at that point, not to help my father. Uh, it, it would be hard for me to say, don't do that again. I know that sounds crazy, but I, I don't know that I can tell him that because I know why I did it at the time. I know what I was trying. I didn't get into the mob because I wanted to be a mobster. I got into that life because I wanted to help my father. But once I got there, I wanted to be the best possible mob guy I could be because that's how I do things. I try to do my best when I do something. But I didn't aspire to be part of that life because of the life. I did it to help my father, plain and simple, 100%. There was no other motivation that I had. Do you feel like everything you did now, it was all worth it? Well, you know, look, I have regrets. There's things I did during my time in that life that I wish I could reverse that never happened. Um, I didn't get into that life to hurt people. I didn't get into that life to, to the way things turned out in some circumstances. But um, so in that regard, I have regrets. Would I have done it differently, posed with the same situation I had back then? Probably not. Are you happy? and content with, with everything that's happened? Are you, are you fully at peace with, with everything now, would you say? Well, you know, if, thanks to my faith I am. Because, you know, I realize one thing. You can never go back and change what happened. What happened, happened. People have said to me, do you do what you do now to make up for what you did in the past? The answer is no. I can't make up for that. It's done is done. You can only move on in your life and try to do better. And, and that's what I do. And, you know, as a person of faith who believes in it, um, that's what we're required to do. And then, you know, God takes care of the rest. Look, we're going to be judged um, at some point in time. I believe that. And um, am I concerned about that judgment? Sure I am. But my faith is strong enough to know that if, if what I'm doing is sincere, then I'm going to be okay. What do you hope the next 5, 10, hopefully 20, 30, long, long life still yeah. ahead um, look like for you? You know, I'm going to continue speaking. Um, I'm going to enjoy my relationship with my wife. You know, as we get into our twilight years, I have grandchildren, I have kids. We're all close. The family is close. Um, I want to see what God has in store for me. I'm going to continue. You know, one thing I've learned, when I was on the street, I was always a leader. And in some ways I am now, but I've learned how to follow my instincts. I don't rush into things. I kind of, you know, make sure that voice in my heart is telling me to do the right thing. I look for di discernment and I move forward. And I don't know. I mean, I am, I've been faced with so many opportunities to do so many different things now. And I'm kind of weeding them through. I, I think a movie is going to inevitably happen on my life. And my wife never wanted it to happen, but I said, honey, it's going to happen anyway. We may as well participate in it. Why should we let somebody else? Let's do it the right way. So that's, that's in development at the moment. I think I'm going to be, um, you know, I'm going to have more media uh, opportunities out there that I'll follow. But my goal is I don't do anything that is in um, conflict with my ministry. It has to complement the ministry in some way. And when I say ministry, being encouraging and uh, to people out there that I, I get involved with. Who is, speaking of, of a leader just a second ago, who is a leader that um, you look up to as a, as a great leader? Billy Graham. You know, I, I, um, I happened to be up, this was several years ago, late one night, and I turned on the television and Billy Graham was in the United Kingdom, I believe it was London, and he was speaking to a, an immense crowd. And I was just so taken in by the power of his message, his delivery, everything about him, and the way he lived his life. 
you know, forgetting the faith aspect of it, just him as a person. Uh, I was very inspired by him. Um, and I never met him. I don't know who he is in that regard, but um, he, he inspired me a lot. When it's all said and done, what do you hope the Michael Franzese legacy is? How do you hope people remember you? You know, good husband, good father, um, you know, did try in the second part of his life to, to do the right thing and had a, a, a powerful Im impact on people in the right way. And you know, what keeps me going, uh, Felix, I get so many really wonderful, um, you know, messages from people, mostly online, you know, that I've had a strong influence on their life and I've turned, and I don't even know these people. But to know that you're out there doing that is great. You know, it's funny, on one of my interviews, I've got, I think, 13,000 comments. And out of the 13,000, maybe 11,000 of them are really complimentary, very nice. The other 2,000, they want to hang me, kill me, you know, throw me off a bridge, the whole bit. And I understand that, you know, I, I get it. Look, you know, if, to some people, my former life is what it is, and it's distasteful, and I shouldn't even have a platform to speak to. I get it. You know, when you put yourself out there, you take the good with the bad. But uh, I don't let it stop me or deter me in any way, because I know what I know, and I move forward. But uh, you want people to think well of you when you're not here anymore. People can find Michael on, uh, on Instagram, I think. I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on YouTube. You're on everywhere. I'm There's everywhere. A, you got two websites, I think. It's I have michaelfrancis.com and I now have wiseguyswisdom.com because I'm now doing some personal coaching uh, beginning in February. I'll be doing that as another, um, I don't want to say project, another... Uh, opportunity that was given to me. People had asked me for years, would you coach me? Would you be my mentor? And so now we're going to do it and offer it to people so that uh, I can have, you know, uh, direct contact with them. And there are lots of, uh, you have a couple books out that people can find. Where can they find them? Uh, anywhere, you know, on my website, michaelfrancis.com. I autograph them when they're bought through me. But, you know, Amazon, they're, they're, they're everywhere. Easy to get. Well, Michael, it's been a, a true pleasure to have you on. You're my first, uh, as I told you earlier, I am from Brooklyn. I flew out here um, to where Newport Beach, California, for, for people who are listening and watching. Um, you're the first guest that I've flown out and made this trip for, but uh, I was so excited when the opportunity came about. Um, so to have you on my show uh, was, a, was a real honor and a pleasure, and uh, I wish you nothing but the best in your Well, I appreciate life. that. And just uh, on your behalf, I'd like to say I do a lot of interviews. And you were very insightful, very prepared, and you asked questions out of the box that haven't been asked before. So for those of you that, that may be considering an interview with Felix, um, I advise you and encourage you to do it because he, uh, he, he does his homework. Thank you so much. Okay. You got it. Beautiful. Beautiful.